I'm gonna pretend I haven't just nearly cried trying to set up these lights. Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing good today. I've been getting really excited for it to get closer and closer to October just cause I've got a few videos in mind I'm really excited to do. I'm a bit scared to kind of say this but I'm hoping and I'm aiming for like two videos a week through October. Let's just hope that that happens. I have every intention to do it but I also have two other jobs. But through October I'm going to try and look at more paranormal things and more true crime with a paranormal twist kind of stories or cases. I'm really excited for it. So I've got one of those minds where I try and do like 20 things at once. So even now just talking I've filmed this about 5 billion times just trying to put my thoughts into words. But I will try and take on like 20 things at once, 20 different cases and I'll do little bits of research and I'll be researching one but then I'll get really excited about something and another one and start looking up that and it always ends up that it gets too late and I've got like five different cases with little bits of research in each rather than just putting all my energy into one case and having it done so I'm really trying to improve on that but we're just going to see how it goes and we're going to all cross our fingers and hope for the best. So this is a UK case from the 70s and it's the case of Leslie Molseed. Leslie Susan Molseed was born on the 16th of August 1964 and she was the youngest of four children. Her family lived in 11 Delamere Road in the Turf Hill Estate in Rochdale. Leslie was described as a really bubbly and sweet little girl. She was really frail and she was really really small for her age and she was 11 at the time that this case takes place. Leslie had a heart condition which affected her health and her development as well and at age three she had to have an open heart surgery and just all through her life she was just that little bit weaker than everyone else. She wouldn't really play out a lot, she'd kind of watch and she just never really had the energy to do much. She was really small, quite thin and just quite a sickly little girl. Leslie lived with April who was her mum and his stepdad Danny and they also lived with Freddie who was her older brother and Laura who was her older sister. She also had another older sister called Julie who lived with their dad Fred. On October the 5th in 1975 it was just a normal day at their house. Leslie and Laura were playing upstairs and April was making some lunch for everyone but it came to get the bread out and she realised she didn't have any so she had this little rota for her kids which I think is a really good idea. It basically had you know whose turn it was to do different jobs around the house, different chores and go to the shops and things like that. So she looked at the rota and it was Leslie's turn. So she called Leslie down and asked her if she wouldn't mind going to the shops and getting some bread for her. So she said, of course. So at half 12, Leslie left the house with a blue raincoat on, one pound in cash and a little blue canvas bag with Tweety Pie on it. Even though Leslie had to walk to the shops, Leslie's mum didn't really mind this. It was pretty safe, everyone kind of did that, everyone just went about the day. It wasn't like it is today where everyone's very cautious, I mean rightly so, but it was just a different time. She didn't think anything of sending her 11 year old to the shops, everyone did it. So around half an hour to an hour of Leslie being gone, Leslie's sister Laura realised that she wasn't back yet and asked her mum where Leslie was. But her mum had said she hadn't returned home yet, she hadn't seen her. And they weren't immediately panicked about where Leslie could be. She was often stopping and talking to people. She was really, really friendly. She was always smiling at everyone. And she'd just stop and kind of have a conversation with people or maybe she'd bumped into a friend and she'd been caught up with that. They went immediately like, oh my gosh, something's happened. Leslie's mum sent Laura, Leslie's older sister, to go round the streets and just look for her, see if she could see her, you know, out or playing and she looked for a while but there was no sign of her. And eventually Freddie and Laura went out and they were looking around the streets and again nothing. There was no sign and they did start to get really worried. They were looking in people's back gardens, in sheds, thinking maybe she was playing some kind of game and was hiding but there was no sign of Leslie whatsoever. His sisters thought that they'd probably be able to trace how far Leslie had gone by the people that she spoke to because she was always letting on to everyone and always stopping to have a conversation but no one had actually spoken to her that day but there were a few people who'd seen her by a very secluded road that led to the shops. Leslie was reported missing to the police and after a few days of her not coming home her family knew that it wasn't looking good for them. Leslie's sister Julie says that their mum was just sat in Leslie's bed holding a pair of shoes and she said to her she's never going to get to wear these Julie and Julie just said 
straight away oh no she's not and that was kind of confirmation that they were both thinking I think something's happened to her and they just both started crying. Three days later on the 8th of October a man who was on a long drive pulled his car up near Rishworth Moor and as he was finding somewhere to go below he spotted a bundle and it was covered in a blue raincoat. As I'm sure you've guessed this was the body of Leslie. She was left roughly nine meters from the roadside and she was face down with stab wounds all over her body. She'd been stabbed 12 times, mostly in her shoulders and her upper back and some in her head too. It looked as though the attack had been really fierce. The knife had been sent into her all the way up to the hilt and 12 times, that's just crazy for a little girl. And I mean, any is crazy for a little girl, but 12 times is excessive, especially when they could see that there was no sign that Leslie had actually tried to put up a fight to whoever had killed her. None of her clothing or possessions were said to be disturbed, but they'd stolen her money. They'd taken her pound. Why would you kill a kid in the first place, but why would you take their pound? Like that's, that's so strange. It's such a strange thing to do. There was semen staining on her vest, on her skirt and on her knickers, and they weren't sure if Leslie had been posed because her knickers were on show when they found her. They collected fibres from Leslie's clothing by putting kind of um, tape on it and then ripping it away so it was stuck to the cellar tape. They also took traces of dry wallpaper paste that they found at the scene too. Obviously everyone was absolutely terrified by this, no one wanted to send their kids out at all, no one wanted to do anything. And the community were asked by the police to come forward if they had seen anything strange or seen Leslie or if they knew anything about this case. It didn't seem that Leslie had put up any kind of a fight, so at first police were looking at people she knew. Maybe she had trusted this person and was willing to go with them, rather than someone she didn't know just grabbing her and her going, kicking and screaming. It looked as though she'd gone willingly with this person. They were looking at her family too, people like her stepdad, teachers, just anyone who she would know, who she would feel comfortable going somewhere with. One person said that they'd been near the moor on the day and said that they'd seen a man with a little girl who matched Leslie's description and there was something about he was reaching down to her and just the way they were acting wasn't as though there was any kind of struggle there. It didn't make the person look twice. Maybe it was a dad and daughter going out they didn't see anything suspicious but then when they heard about Leslie they were very sure that they'd seen them and when police asked them to go to the specific place it was really really close to where Leslie's body was found. A few groups of kids had said that they'd seen Leslie after this sighting was meant to have taken place so that made police question this sighting and eventually they found out that the kids had just made this up. They'd never actually spoken to Leslie that day or seen her and this was like weeks in between these two statements taking place it was like i saw them on the moor no we spoke to her and then ages passed and they were like oh actually we made it up so all that time all that police time was wasted looking into a false story about leslie speaking to these kids outside the shop so um yeah nice one if you were one of those children great job There'd also been multiple reports of a man who was exposing himself to various groups and it was mostly young girls who were reporting this happening. Four girls had a particular story of a man jumping out in front of them, exposing himself to them and then saying something really disgusting, all very big, very dramatic thing to happen and they all ran away but they all had this story that they came forward with and told the police so obviously this was taken very seriously that someone would do this to four young girls then one of the girls actually said yeah the same guy exposed himself to me on bonfire night and she identified this man as a man called Stefan Kishko Stefan was part of a Ukrainian family and he lived with his mum Charlotte he was 23 and he was an inland revenue clerk and a churchgoer when Stefan was 18, he was walking with his dad and his dad had dropped dead in the street right in front of him. So that brought him much closer to his mum and he became quite a mummy's boy. And even though he was 23, he acted a lot younger for his age. He was quite big for his age and he looked a lot older. 
even though he was big, he was described as being a gentle giant by everyone. He was described as a simple soul, as trusting and vulnerable and a misfit. But because of these accusations that had happened around the time of Leslie's murder, he needed to be brought in for questioning and especially because one of the girls had actually said, yeah, it was, it was this guy. Stefan had never been in trouble with the law before ever and he also had the mental age of a 12 year old but they decided that he fit the profile of the kind of person that they were looking for for Leslie's murder. They found sweets and porn in his car and to the police it looked as though this was a way to law kids in and it was just looking really really suspicious and really bad for him so they took Stefan in for questioning. On the 21st of December he was taken in for questioning and he wasn't asked if he wanted a solicitor there and then it wasn't the law to have to have someone present. So he didn't have anyone there at the time of his questioning, it was just him by himself and he even asked for his mum to be there but they said no. Firstly the police were trying to find out if he was the man who'd exposed himself to the girls and he would say that he wasn't even out that day, that he didn't leave the house and then later on he'd say oh I was out that day and he'd kind of go back on things that he'd said. Then he said that on the day that Leslie went missing on the 5th of October, that's the same day he was let out of hospital, so he said that there was no way he'd be out and about then. He said, if I was let out of hospital that day, I would have stayed at home, and he said he was pretty sure that was the day he got out. But then they found out that Stefan had actually been let out of hospital about two or three weeks before that, and the reasons he said he'd been admitted to hospital in the first place were all mixed up. He'd say it was for one thing and then he'd go back and say it was for another thing. So the police just thought this man is lying to us. But when he was pulled up on his lies he said oh it's the testosterone injections I'm getting they make my head go all funny and Stefan had a medical condition that he needed testosterone injections for. I won't go into too much detail but he wasn't sexually active or nothing was happening for him basically so he needed that little boost and he said to the people who were interviewing him that when he had these injections his head was all funny for a bit and he started panicking basically that they were saying that he was lying. So after a while a few of the people who were interviewing him left the room and there was just him and one other person in the room. Now none of this interview was recorded whatsoever but apparently what happened is that Stefan admitted to killing Leslie in that time that there was just him and one other person in the room and he signed a confession to say that he'd done it. Then he had a solicitor present and he said that he wanted to retract the confession but then he'd sat there and admitted to everything and um, took it back and then on the way to a cell because they said that they weren't just going to let him go after everything that had happened on the way to the cell he again started saying that he'd killed Leslie. Because of how Stefan was as a person, he thought that if he admitted to it, they would let him go home. He was constantly asking to go home, to go back and see his mum, and obviously they wouldn't let him, but he thought that if he confessed, that'd be it. Like, he was just kind of asking, like, oh, can I go home now? And they were like, well, no, you've just admitted to murdering someone. So it was all just very, it was a very tricky, mixed up situation because no one else was a suspect at this time. This was the prime suspect and he'd admitted to it. So they just kept him there. On Christmas Eve, he was charged with the murder of Leslie Molseed. On July the 7th in 1976, his trial began. Stefan completely denied all involvement in Leslie's murder, but his team were saying, you know, he didn't do it, but if he did, because they were very aware that he'd admitted to it, they said if he did, it was because of these testosterone injections. It gave him strong, dangerous urges and it made him act out. But then his doctor was there to say, you know, that would never happen with these injections. It kind of builds on what's there. It doesn't give anything new. But he was never called to say this in trial. So that's kind of the story that they stuck with. I'm sorry, there's like five billion planes outside for some reason. There was evidence that he'd broken his ankle months before Leslie's murder, which would have left him unable to jump up to where Leslie was left. Also on the day that Leslie was killed, he had an alibi that he was in Halifax, going to the shops with his mum and also going to put flowers on his dad's grave with her, but none of this was accepted in the trial. 
After the jury deliberated for two hours and 35 minutes, on the 21st of July, he was found guilty of the murder of Leslie Molseed and he was sentenced to life in prison. The girls who had pointed him out for exposing himself were praised, they were called like honest and brave and the mum of the girl, like the main girl who pointed her out was just saying how happy she was that this monster was off the streets, that all the children were now safe and again her daughter was praised. A lot of people wanted to see him hung as well for what he'd done. Stefan was sent to Armley Prison and then was moved to Wakefield Prison. He was attacked in his cell by five prisoners who stole his watch, smashed up his radio, injured his legs and ankles and said that they'd done it for Leslie and her family. He was hit over the head with a mop handle which left him needing stitches in his head. He was attacked in the chapel and he was attacked in the yard as well and when he was attacked in the yard he actually fought back. He was in jail for murdering a child so you can imagine the prison guards were just like mm, poor you, like what do you want from us? Stop asking us to protect you, like you've, you've done this to yourself. So Stefan's mental and physical health was massively deteriorating in prison. Obviously he was being threatened constantly and he was a very timid and gentle man but he was getting beaten up, he was getting death threats and he actually developed schizophrenia when he was in prison. He thought that he was being sent coded messages through the radio. He developed obsessions with certain numbers, he just wasn't doing very well at all. Obviously he didn't want to be in prison for the rest of his life but they made it clear to him that the only way he'd ever get out is if he admitted to killing Leslie which he would never do after the first lot of confessions. Just apologising super quick, I've hit a wall of tiredness and I get really cross-eyed when I'm tired so um, like my eyes are going super red and one of my eyes is gonna turn in soon so I'm just letting you know. <laughs> Just in case I start talking like this, <laughs> like it happens, I'm sorry. So all through this, Stefan's mum, Charlotte, was saying that her son was innocent. She was determined to prove that he was innocent. She really hated the fact that he'd been put away. She knew that there was something wrong with this. She knew that that wasn't her son. The person who'd done this was not her son. He wouldn't do anything like that. She'd even write to the Queen to ask for help. She was absolutely determined to prove that Stefan was innocent. Eventually she found a solicitor called Campbell Malone who was really drawn to her because of how determined she was and how to the point she was. She was like, my son is innocent, he didn't do this, prove it, like, help me. So when Campbell Malone looked into Stefan's case, he realised that there hadn't been a recording of his confession, it was just one person's notes and their word that he'd confessed to any of this so that was a red flag. When the accusations of Stefan exposing himself to the girls had come out there was a man who actually came forward and good on him for doing this he came forward and was like actually I think that was me I was going to the loo and they came around a the corner they saw me they screamed they ran it wasn't anything like they described it because they described a very, um, you know, he jumped out, he said this and then we screamed and then he ran and he was so violent. The girls described it one way whereas the man who was like, no I think that was me but it didn't happen at all like that. He told his side of the story but they wanted to look into this, they were like, well, why is this so different? They caught up with the girls who had originally accused Stefan of doing this, and this was around 16 years into his prison sentence as well, and when they caught up with them, they just said, we made it up. They said, we made it up for a laugh, and a couple of the girls said, oh, I didn't actually see anything, I just heard about it, and I think they just kind of you know, egged each other on with the story and kind of was like, oh, and, and do you remember this? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. And then, then do you remember when he said this? Yeah, yeah, I do. And it was just kind of like that, which is terrifying to think that that put this man in, in prison, essentially. And apparently only one of the girls actually apologised. There was four of them and only one even said sorry. They also looked into the samples that were taken when Leslie's body was found and they looked into the semen samples. Now, Stefan had this condition where he wasn't, you know, there was nothing going on there for him and the semen that was found had a sperm count, whereas Stefan couldn't produce that. So um, I'm not fully, I'm not fully down with um, what all of this means, but 
if I say it simply, you'll get the gist. Um, the sperm that was on Leslie had a count, so it had um, sperm heads, I think they're called. I don't know if that's the same thing, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm, I'm not a scientist, as you can tell. Um, Stefan was, I think, infertile is the right word to use, so his sperm count was always zero. When they looked into all of the samples that they had, they had tons for Stefan, and they knew at the time that the semen found at the scene had sperm heads and Stefan's didn't and there were that many samples because they were trying to constantly prove and tr constantly trying to get a sperm count more than zero to prove that it was him but they couldn't get it but they put him away anyway it's all just very strange that would have proved his innocence in court that would have proved he didn't do it but it was never brought up even though they had that information there they didn't use it for him the forensic scientist and a police officer who was on the case at the time were both charged for perverting the course of justice, but the case was dropped because of how much time had passed. Stefan was found to be innocent and he was let out. He was going to receive £500,000 in compensation and he was saying that he wanted to get married, visit America, Australia and have a good life. He said he was enjoying sleeping in the morning and catching up with friends. But he was understandably still really upset by the fact that this had happened to him even though he was completely innocent. He was released in 1993 but unfortunately just 18 months later he had a heart attack and passed away. And his mum Charlotte died just four months later and the payment that he was meant to get was never given to him. So I don't know where that is now. I don't know if it was given to his family. Maybe it was given to his auntie. I hope it was because I think that was the next person he had. I find it really strange that he wasn't given that 18 months after he was released. Like if I was in charge of that, I'd be given to him like on the day. Like go live your life. We're sorry. But no, he didn't have it. And then because of all the trauma that he'd been puffed through, he died. It's just absolutely horrendous. And his poor mum. So obviously Stefan was found guilty. And for the past 16 years, this had been the person who had killed Leslie. But now Leslie's family were back to having no one. After all this time of believing that the killer was put away, Leslie's family were literally back to square one. They had no idea who this could be. Because the case was an older case now, a lot of people didn't really know who Leslie was anymore. So the family made sure to be handing out flyers and appealing for information again. Leslie's mum, April, said that she didn't believe that she'd see Leslie's killer put away in her lifetime now. On October the 1st, 2005, police were called to an apartment where there was a very upset lady. She was working as a sex worker and she said that she'd been raped by a man called Ronald Castry. He was taken in for this and even though he wasn't charged for this crime, he had a DNA swab taken, which was routine. And when they next ran the database to see if there'd been a match for the semen found on Leslie, there was a match in Ronald Castry. Ronald Castry was born on October the 18th in 1953 and he was a part-time taxi driver. On July the 3rd in 1976, there'd been a sexual assault on a young girl, not far from where Leslie's murder took place. There'd been two nine-year-olds playing in the street and Ronald had approached them in his taxi. He got out the car and went up to them and tried to grab them. One of them ran and ran straight home. The other one was taken by him and driven to an abandoned building. He removed some of her clothes, had her touch him in ways, and then he'd ejaculated. It was very similar to what happened to Leslie. At some point she was able to kick him really, really hard in the leg and get out and escape. She went straight to her mum who went straight to the police and he was taken in, he was identified, everything was going well until, I can't even, I'm going to get mad again. You'd think he'd be put in prison, he wasn't put in prison, he was given a £25 fine. I've seen in other places saying it was £50. Even so, doesn't what in what world is that okay? Like what the hell? Like my notes literally say twenty five pound. What the fuck in it? I don't even want to say anything about it because I will not shut up for about an hour. Like I'm so I'm so angry at that. Ronalds was twenty two years old at the time, and he actually went in to his wife and said, "Oh, I've I've done it. I've interfered with the child." 
and obviously she was just like what the hell but his parents actually defended him and was saying that he was going through something and he'd get help. Beverly said that they rushed into their relationship. She was very young when they married. Just after three months of seeing each other, they were engaged. It was a very quick relationship and Ronald was not a very nice man at all. He would have multiple affairs that she knew of and he was violent towards her, he was abusive and that led her to go and have an affair too. From that affair, she got pregnant and she had a son. On October the 3rd, just two days before Leslie was murdered, they were taken back to hospital because of complications, both her and the baby. So a lot of people think that this might have been some kind of motive for Ronald. I, I don't understand it. It's the thing, like, I always go, oh, I understand why he did that. Doesn't ever mean that I agree with it. It just means, like, I can see why this type of person was led to do the things that they do but even with this like i don't understand the um the link between like maybe he was mad at his wife for having a son so why would you go and do that to a, a little girl who's got nothing to do with the family do you know what i mean um i find that a bit weird but a lot of people think that that was a motive the fact that he was angry now that his wife had given birth to a child that wasn't his so he went and did something horrible. Ronald and Beverly had another child as well that was Ronald's child. Even his kids say that he drank heavily, he was on painkillers. Even his kids knew that he had an interest in younger women or younger girls and school children things. No not great not nice and uh, i hate talking about stuff like this because like my family watch me say these things i'm sorry um yeah he try and get her to do like school girl things for him and when she said no he would say in front of his children well i'll go and get that somewhere else and he would go to sex workers to do that for him and I feel so bad for his family the way that they talk you can tell they're absolutely mortified by the way he used to behave especially a story and um, I can't remember if it was Beverly or his son who was telling this story but they spoke about a time when they were all on holiday so it was Ronald Beverly and the two boys and they said that he would send the boys off to play so he could watch all the girls around the pool and there was one time that there was another couple there with their two daughters and Ronald made them that uncomfortable that they literally got up and left because he would just like go up at girls. If this guy couldn't get any more creepy, he'd been running a comic book shop in Ashton Underline since 1990. I'm not saying that people who run comic book stores are, are creepy at all, um, but he is because it's thought that this was his connection to both kids and also that kind of fantasy world but it's just a little bit um, convenient that that's the kind of thing he went into with his interests shall we say beverly said that all through their marriage basically since the murder of leslie that um, she didn't know about that he was jumpy, he'd constantly think people were at the door, he'd wake up in the middle of the night and jump out of bed, say someone was in the garden. He was thinking that they were coming for him constantly and she'd say to him, like, what, what is this? What's going on with you? And he'd just say, oh, if only you knew, Bev. And she'd be like, well, what? And then he'd tell her not to bring it up again and she just never knew what he was on about, didn't know what this big secret was that he was hiding. Their marriage ended in 1997 and I'm so glad Beverly got out of that and their sons. On November the 5th in 2006, Ronald was arrested for the murder of Leslie. He was saying, are you joking? This is ridiculous. Saying that he'd never met Leslie before. He doesn't know how they came to that conclusion that his DNA was found at the scene. He denied everything, but obviously they had proof that his DNA was at the scene and he was the person who had murdered Leslie that day especially with them having evidence even though it was stupid the fact that they just let him walk free after what he did to that poor little girl <clears throat> winds me up but they were so similar in the way that the attacks were carried out even though thankfully that little girl escaped and um, the nine-year-old leslie hadn't been so lucky unfortunately 
but leading up to the point where he would murder someone, it followed the same kind of pattern. Leslie's family were in complete disbelief. Obviously, they were really thankful that he'd been caught. Leslie's mum especially after saying she'd never thought that the killer would be put behind bars in her lifetime. She was really happy and she was happy with the closure, but obviously it was really, really strange to have had this happen so long after the crime was committed and after what happened with Stefan. And with Ronald's family, they were also like devastated. They'd been used as a cover up all these years. They just felt cheated. They felt so angry and upset by all this. And obviously they had no idea that this was going on. And on October the 22nd in 2007 at Bradford Crown Court, Ronald's trial was going to begin and the families would have to meet. Leslie's family were a bit iffy understandably about meeting Ronald's family and Ronald's family were very iffy about meeting Leslie's family because Leslie's family at first thought that maybe Beverly had known that Ronald did this and had hidden it too which obviously you wouldn't really want to come to face to face with someone who'd helped cover this up. But police assured Leslie's family that Beverly had absolutely no idea so then they said they let the guard down with meeting her. Leslie's family were really lovely and they said to Beverly, you go out there and you hold your head up, you've done no wrong. It was said to be a really tense trial and Beverly was so, so worried that he would kind of slip through the net again and get away with this. But luckily he was found guilty and he was sentenced to life with a minimum of 30 years. And I'm so, so glad that he's finally been put away for what he did, even though it took so much time and God knows how much stuff he's done you know, in the meantime. We don't know that it was just the murder of Leslie and the assault of the nine-year-old. That was all he did. I, I very much doubt it. He's probably done so much more that no one knows about. Obviously, I'm sure everyone thinks the same as me with this, but I just wish that they'd got to him sooner. I don't understand how he was able to just walk away from what he did to that nine-year-old girl. I understand that that was after he'd killed Leslie, but why wasn't that done then? Who on earth lets someone go from that with a fine? Like, what the hell? Like, that's someone's child, that's someone's little girl, and that little girl has got to go through her life with that having happened to her. That is such an insult for her to be that brave to go straight to her mum. Like, even telling your mum, I imagine if that happens to you when you're that little, that must be so scary because I feel like you'd kind of think that you were in trouble at the same time. To go to your mum is hard, to go to the police is even harder. She did all that and then it was just like, oh well, we'll have some money and then he can go. Wrong on so many levels, I really hope that girl is doing okay. Obviously, I'm so, so gutted that this happened to Leslie. I feel really sorry for her family, especially with them not having that closure for that many years and with the roller coaster it took to get there. And with Stefan's family too, like, what the heck? This, this single man, like, Ronald, ruined so many lives. Like, I've seen interviews with Stefan and he just seems so sweet and I just feel so bad for him and his mum. She knew 100% that his son was completely innocent and she fought so hard and held on until she'd kind of done all she could for him. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this case interesting. I am just heartbroken by the whole thing. How many families did that man mess up? Oh my gosh. So through October, I'm hoping to put a few Halloween-y things out. So please like, subscribe, comment, hit the notification bell so you are notified when all of those different things come out. I upload a new true crime video every single Sunday. I will still be uploading it through October. There will just be extras all thrown in through the week. Hopefully, fingers crossed, please send energy for me to do this and actually stick to my word because I am determined, but as I've said before and in other videos, I think I have got two other businesses. I mean, this, I don't, I don't earn anything from this yet, hopefully one day, but I've got two businesses that I run full time and YouTube and a dog who always wants to be in the same room as me. Like, bang on cue. Sorry, I've got a visitor. 
If you haven't already, please follow me on Twitter and Instagram because I like to ask questions about what you want to see next there. And it's just a way for me to keep you up to date on what's going on. If I'm running a bit late with a video, you'll know because I'll probably post it there. Um, I'm not doing a weird dance, by the way, I'm stroking my dog. <laughs> um, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next one. <laughs> Hello. If anyone wants me to do a video about this little girl, let me know because I would love to do a video on her. Um, ignore her nail, she's due a little trim, but we get kicked in the face when we try and cut her nails, so we try and avoid it wherever possible because she turns into a demon. Oh, she's a star. Is it like a really like serious murder? Yeah. It's a child murder and she's just like... She's popping in. Yeah, she's Anna, popping this is, in. This is not appropriate, sweetheart. Come on. Anna, Anna, do you want some chicken? <laughs> Tati bye. <laughs> Shall we go and snuggle? Shall we? Shall we go and snuggle? Bye guys. <laughs>